Hi, uh, I'm Eva Morava, and I would like to share with you uh, new ideas about uh, developing therapies in congenital disorders of glycosylation. Normal glycosylation in the cell is a step-by-step -step process which starts with activating the sugars in the cytoplasm, then building from these sugar blocks um, a step-by-step -step, sugar chain, which is called an oligosaccharide. And after the chain is ready, it's transferred to a protein or a lipid, which we call glycolipid or glycoprotein, and goes under some more editing and uh, secreted out from the cell uh, through the Golgi. Congenital disorders of glycosylation are a large group of genetic defects in this pathway. Um, this uh, complex disorder group accounts more than 160 different CDG types, all different genetic background. Um, a very important disorder group as most of our functional proteins are glycosylated. So CDG, the group of disorder affects every organ. For 166 CDGs, there is no FDA approved therapy. How do we diagnose this disorder? A simple way of diagnosing it, uh, diagnosing it is to test a glycosylated protein, which is abundant in blood, um, it's called a transferrin. Transferrin has two glycan antennas, so the normal transferrin, we call it the oligotransferrin because there are two oligosaccharide chains um, attached to the protein. When there is a congenital disorder of glycosylation or a secondary glycosylation disorder, um, the glycan can go missing. So there is only one mono oligotransferrin, or it can be such a severe disorder that we might have no glycan chain uh, detectable on uh, on the protein the assay. So unfortunately, this is great for diagnosis or screening, but this marker can go up and down in a patient's uh, uh, lifespan. So there, it's unreliable for follow up and there is a big unmet need <clears throat> to develop or find biomarkers uh, for a potential treatment uh, follow-up in CDG. CDG affects all organs and organ systems. There is no organ or organ system in the body which wouldn't or couldn't be affected by this uh, complex disease. <clears throat> As I mentioned, there are more than 160 different types the most common type uh, is um, uh, PMM2 CDG. That's the name of the gene and uh, the disorder. Um, it's about one in 80,000. Uh, it's still a re really rare disease. But most CDG types know only 10, or 10 to 30 patients. Some CDG types have only three cases known ever. So how do we design clinical trials for three patients? This is just a nice picture uh, from um, uh, a publication where we um, have a composite picture of all the different CDG bases all together. Uh, we established um, um, a consortium to help diagnosis treatment uh, and research and education in CDG. The Frontiers in CDG uh, Consortium uh, has 13 sites in the United States and uh, already two European sites to collaborate and push our cause uh, together further. What kind of therapeutic options are there in CDG? Uh, if you go back to this uh, diagram, then uh, you can just based on the photo mechanism, come up with some ideas. Uh, first, then the most traditional way of treating CDGs is to supplement the patients with excess dietary monosaccharides to increase the available sugar pool for activation. Other therapies could be uh, based on a later uh, problem in the process, for example, supplement the activated monos or use chaperone therapy or drug repurposing, um, uh, mostly um, 
aiming at uh, activating certain enzymes uh, and steps in the pathway. Transplantation is um, a method of treatment out of desperation in many cases in a uh, terminal phase of the disease and a potential future treatment is gene therapy. So right now, therapy in CBG is mostly symptom specific um, and sometimes surgery or transplantation. And on the right hand side, you see all the different potential experimental treatments we would like to evaluate and bring into clinical trials in CBG. To show you how difficult is uh, therapy development in this large number of rare disorders, I just give it a historical example, MPI-CBG. Uh, here is the pathway, fructose 6 phosphate um, will uh, uh, turn to uh, mono 6 phosphate uh, due to the um, MPI enzymatic step, which then increases monose one phosphate, which can be built into the oligosaccharides uh, of the glycans. So patients generally have a very severe early presentation, hepatomegaly, edema, coagulation defects, a thrombotic episodes, uh, stroke, hypoglycemia, chronic diarrhea, it's a life-threatening disease we can um, treat with uh, monose supplementation. Giving um, extremely high monose dose in these patients um, activates another enzyme in the body, which compensates for the defective MPI um, enzyme and restores glycosylation. This is a therapy we have been using uh, um, since almost uh, 20 years um, based on um, our experience that high monose diet improves the patient's quality of life. Uh, patients have no hepatomegaly uh, co coagulation defects um, uh, or hypoglycemia, the diarrhea disappears. Uh, there is no question in the mind of a clinician that this ther uh, therapy works. However, this has never been systematically trialed. The disorder is one in a million, so most clinicians see one patient in their life, even if they are specialists. Uh, we do have natural history data available, but scattered um, with the individual physicians, and nobody dares to stop treatment to see if the clinical picture will come back after washout because um, the patient can die in a thrombotic episode. So this is just an example how difficult it is to start any clinical trial in this group. I would like to switch now to drug purposing because that's our main topic in this um, uh, discussion and run a round table. And I, I would like to show you a promising new, um, a promising new therapeutic approach um, we work on in PMM2 CDG. This is the most common um, type of CDG. And in a worm model of this disease, um, small molecule library screening um, showed uh, that um, uh, um, all those reductase inhibitors, um, a group of, of molecules um, uh, which um, are used in the treatment of diabetic neuropathy um, appear to increase the PMM2 enzyme activity in these genetically defective worms. So uh, upon this finding, we also tested um, uh, FRS, that's one of these uh, candidate drugs in fibroblasts of patients, and we found a positive response not in all the patients, um, but um, several of the patients um, responded uh, in a positive way, and some of them quite significantly increased their enzyme activity. ICAM-1, which is a marker of glycosylation because it's a protein uh, which is highly glycosylated, um, measurable on uh, the surface of patient fibroblasts showed that several patients improved their glycosylation uh, on this um, FRS therapy, uh, but as you see, not all the patients uh, reacted the same way. So how could this new drug or drug group work? 
um, uh, and how would that um, improve glycosylation in our patients? So the, the hypothesis is that um, uh, the, uh, all those with oxyacetase inhibition might increase glucose one six by phosphate uh, pools, and um, this molecule is a known uh, stabilizer of the PMM2 enzyme. Also, this would uh, increase uh, sugar fluxes and um, um, improve uh, GDP monose availability, which is a most important uh, precursor of, of glycan synthesis. And it, in addition, there is um, an advantage that uh, redox potential changes um, could also improve uh, PMM2 related uh, cellular dysfunction. In our um, in vitro experiments, we evaluated whether the hypothesis is uh, true. So um, I just show you the pathway um, uh, related to glycosylation. There is monose 6-phosphate, monose 1-phosphate, GDP monose, which is leading to glycosylation. And it's, um, uh, of course, the pathways are all interconnected. So you see fructose linked to sorbitol. You see um, these molecules uh, linked to glucose 6-phosphate. And um, you see that the pathway is, um, is linked to sorbitol through all those reductase. So the question was, is it possible that um, this enzyme deficiency improves uh, because all those reductase blockage would increase glucose 1,6,5-phosphate levels, which will stabilize the enzyme. We measured by uh, metabolomics that glucose 1,6-phosphate levels indeed increased on epoarestat treatment in patient fibroblasts. And then the even more important than the question, if this is true, it's increased and it stabilizes the enzyme, would that make more monose 1-phosphate and GDP monose, which we also showed in patient fibroblasts that indeed both pools uh, uh, got increased. And then the final question is whether this would lead this would lead to an improved glycosylation. So we used uh, glyco glycoproteomics to measure um, uh, abnormal glycosylation in patient fibroblasts. And this is a logarithmic scale comparing uh, um, uh, patients uh, to controls. And you see that extreme shift towards a hypoglycosylation uh, in the fibroblast uh, uh, culture. And here you see actually only patients compared to each other, untreated to treated. And what you see is there is a significant improvement, improvement of glycosylation in the patients who were treated compared to untreated. So we could prove that actually our therapy is improving glycosylation in vitro. Then the next step is um, what other metabolic changes are um, uh, present in parallel with uh, this finding, and it would be logical to express, expect that if you need to block all those reductase to get the flux improving PMM2 activity this way, then pro probably this, uh, uh, this treatment will also uh, ha have an effect on sorbitol levels. So the first question was, are sorbitol levels increased to begin with? And the answer was yes. And the second question was, if they are increased, um, would FRS treatment um, improve the levels? And they were indeed um, decreased um, after treating the cells with FRS. We went back to the patients and uh, collected urine samples uh, from um, almost 30 patients with PMM2 CDG and um, uh, collecting uh, uh, these samples, uh, we also uh, evaluated the patient's severity score by the NIMAGEN uh, patient uh, CDG rating scale, which is a 
uh, three-step rating scale uh, of severity in CDG. Um, we were um, uh, we did find a positive correlation between uh, disease severity and uh, sorbitol uh, levels in the patient's urine, which uh, was elevated in uh, more than 70% of PMM2 CDG patients in this cohort. And we also found uh, correlation with uh, the presence of peripheral neuropathy in our patients. So sorbitol seems to be a potential biomarker for severity assessment and for potential uh, therapeutic trial endpoints for the future. From testing patient cells, um, we um, continued with natural history uh, data collection and uh, submitted a single patient IND for one of our patients who was treated uh, for a year with Eparestat. And uh, we, um, uh, we observed several positive changes um, in our patient's um, uh, clinical outcome and biochemical outcome. Her body mass index percentile improved significantly during the treatment uh, period. Um, her uh, ICAR score, um, which is um, ataxia and balance, uh, fine motor function and speech scaling improved with more than 10%. Um, sorbitol levels and monitol levels uh, significantly improved during um, a few months, actually four months of, of treatment. And the glycosylation of transferrin improved significantly as well all pointing to, towards a potential benefit, beneficial effect of Eparestat uh, in our PMM2 CDG patient. Um, this study was not possible without uh, our amazing research team, uh, the CDG Patient Association, and our Frontiers of CDG Consortium support. This is just the first step towards developing therapies in this complex disease group, only one genetic type, which has hope now for therapy. And there are still so many questions. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer questions later. <laughs>